Uh, yeah, bees to the box, getting up and running. I want bees to the box, getting started from scratch. Make no assumptions about whether you bought your equipment or not. Don't take offense if you bought it and we tell you something different. We'll get past that. <laughs> we'll do an installation overview. I'm going to take you through all this equipment that I brought and answer whatever questions, of course. We'll follow this session by build up to a full-size colony and mite monitoring. So you know I'm not going to talk about that today. Which somebody already came up and said, I'm a second year beekeeper, are you going to talk about that? And I said no, and she said okay, thanks. And she left, which is okay by me. At the end of the section, you know, question mark. Uh, this was built as two separate presentations, so forgive if someone's redundant. These are the things that I'm going to talk about at a high level. Where you're putting your stuff, be a good neighbor, how to get your equipment, how to buy your bees. I'm going to say some things that are actually probably unconventional. I didn't say this before, but if you look, it's partially cut off. That is my logo for the Beekeeper's Corner podcast. I do a beekeeping podcast. The majority of this content was harvested out of my getting started in beekeeping guide. I'm going to work over the year to build a full how to do this for other people besides Northwest, but I'm partnering with Northwest to deliver this program. So when I talk about certain things, anybody from the club can feel free to yell at me if I don't align with them, but I'm going to give you some of my personal opinion because I'm used to giving answers to people and I want to keep it doggy ducky horsey. So I'm going to limit your options on some things just to clear the clutter. I could tell you about this great and wonderful beekeeping suit that you could buy from Italy. I know about them, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Okay, I'm going to stay straight down the middle. What I'll do is I'll give you some advice, insights about the thing. You can ask whatever questions you want if you've heard something. And then we'll give you what the actual <coughs> advice is. Go do this part, okay? Be a good neighbor. This is obligatory. I don't know how you are with your neighbors. I have great relationship with all of ours. But if you don't have good neighbors and you tend to have a small yard and they see bees, literally, doesn't matter whether you have a huge yard. I know people who have big yards put bees in it, don't like their neighbor, blows up, right? So the first thing you have to say to yourself is, how am I with my neighbors? A promise of a jar of honey goes a long way, that's a good thing. But you know, you might also try to pick places where your neighbors can't see your bees if you don't get along with your neighbors. So the answer is know thy neighbor, right? Be a good neighbor and do the things that we tell you to try and prevent any impact to them. If your neighbor next door tells you that their daughter is deathly allergic to bees and has been on death's bed, maybe you really need to consider your options and put your bees on somebody else's property, not yours. But the key thing, the key thing to keep you out of trouble is don't put tons of hives on your property if it's not big enough and make sure they're far enough away from your neighbor's property lines. We want you to start with two hives. If you were sitting here today going, I'm only planning to buy one, let us try to convince you to go get another one. The reason being is you don't know what you're looking at. And when one hive starts, if you got a queen that was a dud and you're looking at it, you may not be any of the wiser. If you have two hives, chances are two duds is not likely going to happen. This one over here is going to town, and that one over there looks lackadaisical. You can't tell that without it. And then how do you fix this hive? Maybe you use resources out of this hive and put it in that hive to correct the problem. The other thing is, look, you have a 100% chance of losing your hive if your hive dies. If you have two hives, you have a 50% chance that you'll probably get one of them through, right? That it's about math. Um, we do not want you to start with five. More is not better. 10 is certainly a no for a new beekeeper. You'll get overwhelmed very quickly. One of the key things is, I don't know about you, but I have a day job. And you want to make sure that you allocate enough time 
And the more hives you get, the more responsibility you have to take care of them. So keep it to two to start. When you get good at this, feel free to make more. We want you to be a beekeeper, not a bee haver. It's a pretty common term, right? But the key to this is we're going to give you a plan and we anticipate you're going out and doing inspections and that you understand what your brood looks like or your frame, right? And what the nest looks like when you pick it up. Um, you have to invest in it. It has to be managed. This is like livestock. It's not the simplistic put them in a box and they live, right? I like that. They're not lawn ornaments. Some people love copper roofs and they have no idea how the heck the hive works, right? You have to prepare for a lifetime of this. When you buy a dog or a cat or chickens, you got to know that next year you're still going to be out there taking care of these things. It's a commitment. And there's a lot of activities that go on in keeping a beehive going. Now you can go on summer vacation, that's what's cool about it, but you do know that you have to commit X amount of time and resources. So talk to your significant other if you have one and make sure that they know that, you know, next weekend you're going to be out in the yard taking care of your bees because you have to. Let's talk about bees. There's two common forms to obtain peas. Let's just do a poll. How many are starting brand new? How many have ordered bees already? Okay, most of you. How many are going with packages? Most of you. How many are going with a nucleus hive? A handful. Okay. I, t I just needed to understand that so we speak. A package is literally that, a package. Looks like this thing. Comes with bees in it. I'll talk about this a little more later when we talk about how to get one of these or how to install it. That box over there, the cardboard box is a nuke box. They're usually made out of wood. That one happens to be cardboard. Um, this is how you get bees. Now some of you might go, well, I'll get a swarm. I'm getting somebody else's bees. Is anybody getting anybody else's bees? No? Okay. Good. I won't talk about that then. Chances are you all bought your bees already. Is there anybody that still hasn't bought their bees? A couple of you, okay. I needed to, obligatory, tell you what that cost, right? Three pound package, thanks Bob, is about 135, 150. Your mileage may vary, right? Depending on who you're buying them from. If you're trying to buy a nucleus hive, and for those that don't understand, this bee box is 10 frames. A nucleus hive is half a hive. It has five frames with bees, a queen, fully operational hive, just in miniature. You could buy a package and put them in a blank box, or you can buy a nuke which is started and put that in the box and let them build. They grow faster, they get going, right? Versus having to start and build wax and do all that stuff. They cost more, obviously because somebody's had to do care and feeding for them. So 165, 175. The problem with nukes is the high to the low tends to be pretty widespread depending on where you're getting them from. I would ask around or ask one of us on the side about where you're buying your bees from, but you want five frame nuke. Don't buy a two frame, three frame. You want five full frames. There's a kind of nuke called an overwintered nuke. There's a strategy in the world that if you buy bees that have overwintered in this area versus a nuke box that was assembled by bees from Georgia with a new queen from Georgia or some other place versus I went out in my yard, I split a hive in half and I'm giving you half of the hive and it overwintered in New Jersey. There's a premium for this. The advantage is supposed to be that bees that were cultured in New Jersey are better. They're better for you. Versus a bee that was in warm weather and was brought up here to New Jersey in the cold and doesn't, is not acclimated yet, <coughs> right? 
you want your bees to be from here. So another thing about buying your, you can't buy a package from here, but you can buy a nuke from here. Is it really an advantage? I don't know. You'll pay more for it. <coughs> I generally think it's not about the bees that you buy, it's about how you care for them. That's my personal opinion. I will say that you want to use somebody who's been in business for a long time, has a good track record, and if they're making their own queens, knows what they're doing, right? And again, you could talk to one of us on the side about that if you have questions. There's all kinds of bee types. Italian bees, Carniolian bees, Caucasian bees, Russian bees. I say to you, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Just buy bees. That's controversial. Some people will swear to you that certain types of bees that you buy, hybridized bees, right? They are ankle biters. They are uh, hygienic. My answer is if I talk to anybody who's selling bees, they'll tell you that they're sourcing their queens with these traits already. Now, you can go somewhere and buy a Minnesota Hygienic. It's a brand name. What you get from that is a bee that has been certified by the seller to have the traits that Minnesota Hygienic people say this bee will do, right? You guys don't even know what that is, so why are you worried about it? If you get a queen and you put her in your hive and then she cultures more bees, she's intermingling with everybody else's hive. Unless they all have Minnesota Hygienic or Purdue ankle biters, you're diluting the stock right away. I think it's too fussy for new people to worry about strains of bees. If you get a package from Gardner in Georgia, he's already doing his best to salute source good queen genetic material because he doesn't want to sell crap. So I'm not going to tell you don't go get a special queen if that's your bent, right? What I'm telling you is you don't have to. Good enough is perfect. That's one of my favorite things. Good enough is perfect. Transport and install. I don't know whether you're getting shipped literally to your house. How many of you knew the post office will deliver your, your bees to your front door? Yeah, they will. They've been doing it forever. Or you go somewhere and get them and bring them home, right? You have to know what this means. And we'll tell you how to install, give you an overview of that. Yes, there are races of bees. Yes, there are bees selected for trace. Yes, they come in different colors. Black bees are always said to be Carniolian bees, yellow bees tend to be called Italian. The really creamy looking ones are referred to as Cordovan. The fact of the matter is it's just how that bee went out and met whoever she met and that's why she ended up the way she is. And the trait came out that made her the color she is. There's too much emphasis on that. So your mileage may vary just by reputable bee supplier bees. Don't go down to Cousin Vinny on the corner who decided he was going to keep bees last year and he's going to sell you a nuke and you get a box that has two frames of crappy bees and you have no idea how his queen is mated. You want to go to someone who's on a website for New Jersey Beekeepers Association and get your bees that way. If you wanted special shiny bauble bees, you're probably too late because they're in high demand. There are people who still buy that stuff and they've got all the orders and you can't get them anyway, so don't fuss over it. Next year, if you want to try a certain race of bee or certain genetic strain and you're gonna add more hives, you better plan in the, in the winter time, okay? I will go back to this point, the difference in most cases, the beekeeper, not the bee stock you start with. So go to the New Jersey Beekeepers Association page, go to resources, and you will see everybody that sells bees in New Jersey, if you haven't bought your bees yet. Um, 
You can also, I guess, buy from major bee suppliers like Man Lake and others. I, I even think you could probably go to uh, tractor supply this year, right? Am I, am I right in that, anybody? I haven't been in our tractor supply. Yeah. So how about that? I don't know where they get their bees from. It's your personal preference whether you do a package or a nuke. Packages are perfectly fine. They really are. Um, you know, you have to consider how much money you want to put out, how fast you need to have your bees build out, which really is not relevant, where they're coming from, whether you could get them, the timing of your being able to go get them, things like that, right? It's not right for us to tell you who to buy from. I really can't. Me, Kevin, I'm taking my Northwest hat off and I'm going, I know from experience in this area, two people who sell bees, Stan Wazitowski at SNF and Grant Stiles are very well known and they, they do a good job at it. And I personally have bought bees from Stan. Now I'm going to take my personal off and go, go to New Jersey Beekeepers website because there's others in this area that sell bees and they're fine too. When it arrives, you need to clear your calendar and install the bees. You don't want them laying around. It's better to get them in, get started, get them acclimated, or get them transferred. Now sometimes when you bring a package thing home, you get a March snowstorm. <laughs> and you go, hmm, I'm not gonna go out and install it. That's okay. We'll give you instructions in April, closer to when your package is gonna arrive on how to hold your bees if you have to. And we'll also tell you how to install a package. I highly encourage you to come to our April meeting. We're gonna physically take two packages and install them. If you bring a nuke home, there's two ways you do this. You take your equipment and you put the nuke stuff in your box and you bring it home. Or you bring the literal nuke home from the supplier, put it in your yard, and then after a while, when it's established in the site where you're going to put it, you take the nuke off the stand, you take the frames out, put it in your box, and put your frames in with it, and you give that equipment back to the guy, gal, wherever you got it from. The reason you bring that home and you put it on your stand is so that the bees can acclimate it to where they live in a hive that's fully operational. And then when you switch them over to a bigger box, it just happens and everything's good. Okay? We'll provide instructions on the management mentoring site, written instructions that you could print and take out and go, okay, first thing they said to do was take the cap off and, okay? So, question? Yeah. You said uh, the meeting you have is on the 13th? Correct. All right. Stan's bees are coming on the 12th. Well, yeah. Yep. Friday, yes. Yeah, you can keep them overnight. They'll be fine in the package yep. overnight. You don't have to install them that Friday. Yeah, this is, yeah, thanks for asking that question. Keep asking, that's what the question, this is the deal. We get our bees from Stan for the packages for that. Um, we want you to come to that meeting and see how to install the packages and then go home and do what we just showed you. You don't have to figure it out. We'll literally show you. Any other questions? Nukes are May, right? Yeah, generally May. If you get a nuke in June, it's probably too late and you should be careful about that, right? You want them to, to be by May. Uh, just look, common sense. If you're gonna put them in your car and drive them home, please make sure they're secure. <laughs> and you might wanna post a sign, live bees inside. Um, we'll talk about, you know, it's inevitable you're gonna have a bee inside the car with you as you're driving home. I went and picked up a nuke and there were bees all over the place. I literally drove home, got my suit, went back, put the nuke in and drove home in a bee suit. So <laughs> it's not out of the question. <laughs> Depends on how you are. Yeah? Where should they put their bees? So if they get them Friday, they shouldn't leave them in the car. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you want to put them inside where they're comfortable. Where you're comfortable, they'll be comfortable. And then you want to look at them and if they're fanning, that means they're hot. But chances are if they're inside your house and your house is a comfortable position, you're okay with them. And again, we'll provide you guidance on how to store your bees in case that situation comes up. You can't bring them in your house? Uh, <laughs> My wife's allergic, so. 
so I just yeah. keep them far away. You have a garage? I have a shed. If you have to keep them in the shed, keep them in the car, you can do that. Right. Just make sure you check on them. Gear and equipment, let's keep going. Uh, of course, you don't want to get stung when you're new. That's probably one of the biggest hurdles. You need to have that rite of passage. So you need protection. Typically, you have three options. You could be cowboy up and wear a veil and a t-shirt, go all bravado, or you could be full space suit. I don't, don't care. Whatever it is, is you need to be comfortable, right? Um, the big thing about being comfortable is we don't want you to rush. Working with bees is a ballet. You need to be zen, right? If you're rushing, slamming, crushing, you're releasing alarm pheromone, which is, means attack the beekeeper, and you just don't want that. You need to know what you're doing and work very methodically with what you do. So comfort and dexterity and flexibility, because some of these suits that I've seen for sale are just, I don't know how you would work with them. When we were in Africa, these guys had these gloves that, that looked like spaceship things with big, huge rubber gloves. There's no way they could work the bees effectively in them. So coveralls or beekeeping jacket or jeans, all right? I don't have coveralls today, but they are the best thing. If you're worried about getting stung, there's no harm in a full head to two, head to toe coverall suit. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Just, uh, I just thought of going back to uh, getting bees. Would you suggest getting the queen marked? Yes. I think it's a good idea for a new one, for a new beekeeper. When, when you pull up a frame and she's right there, that, that's a lot easier and you're not spending a lot of time having the hive open searching for your queen and it's really a good insurance policy. That's a good one. Uh, your queen can come with a paint job. <laughs> what a beekeeper does is they take the queen out and they put her into this special device and they take a marking pen and they mark her with a certain color. The color tells you how old the queen is. They mark her thorax. I have a thing in the kit but I'm not going to bother showing you. So. It, it serves two purposes. It helps you find the queen on a frame. It also indicates to you how old your queen is, meaning if it's green, it's this year's queen. If it's red, it's last year's queen. There's a, you don't have to study on that right now, we'll tell you. Um, the other thing that happens when you mark your queen, which is really good for a new person is, sometimes you buy a package, and maybe something happened and that queen didn't get mated well, and the bees decide, got to go and they replace her. If you pull your frame up and you see a queen running around and she's not marked, then you know that the queens did a supersedure, which is a replacement. This is a beekeeping jacket made of canvas. You can buy a jacket with or without a veil. This one zippers off. Some of them just have a straight collar. It affords perfectly fine protection. This thing can get very hot in the summertime. This is a new, I say new, it's old by now, type of one that's a three layer mesh. And if you hold this up to the light, you can literally see through it. And literally when you're sweating and standing out there, the air blows through and you can feel it on your skin. I'll hand this around. The premise of this is that the materials, three mesh, are so thick that the stinger can't get through to your skin. If you've never seen one of these, I would recommend it. It's a little more expensive, but now they've come to be almost the same price as this. Yes, you can get stung through these. I've never been stung in one of those, in that one, for whatever reason. Never been stung. They've never got me on that. Who um, sells this one? That one happens to be from Dedant. Everybody sells them now. The original was Ultra Breeze, and they make a very good one. I got my two from Stan when I uh, yeah. bought some other stuff he has in there. Um, I say veil. This is a veil. I would recommend that you wear a beekeeping jacket. But I also recommend that you buy a helmet. That's what this is. Helmet style veil and have it in your kit. There's tons and tons of different kinds of veils. 
their cloth on the top and whatever. They got pretty flowers on some of them. Buy a helmet one because you won't get stung on the head with a helmet one. And then if you want a pretty one, you can get one later. But I really want, don't want you to get stung in that way, okay? If you go out on an afternoon and go, ah, my bee suit's in the garage, but whatever the case may be, and I want to go out and just check the bees, you could take this in your clothes, street clothes, and go stand and you should wear this. Now, you guys are sitting way in the back, how you doing? I have stood this far from the hives, just looking to see whether they're flying or not, and bang, you get stung. There's something about being that far that they just are guarding that area where you enter into their domain. If you get stung in the eye or somewhere here, you could do nerve damage and they'll literally sting your eyeball, right? So a responsible beekeeper wears a veil. I see Bob smirk. <laughs> Thank you. I would recommend, I would recommend that you buy a beekeeping jacket, but if you really want the full protection, buy yourself a full suit, that's fine. I do not recommend for a new person to wear just a veil and a t-shirt, long sleeve shirt, you're going to get stung. And on that one occasion where you go out and you do something wrong, like God forbid drop a box, you're going to get lit up. A full suit or a jacket will allow you at least to retreat with your pride intact. I brought these here and I was looking for the ones and I couldn't find them. I want to talk about gloves to protect your hand, right? And obviously what you need is something that protects your hands. However, these gloves, well these are borderline, but I'm telling you they're really super thick. Your fingers don't bend. And if you don't have the dexterity to hold a frame, some of these things are meant for welding, right? And this just isn't going to work. You can't feel what you're doing. You reach underneath the frame and you're squishing bees and you're releasing alarm pheromone. When you squish a bee, its last act is to release a chemical that calls the, the hive to defense. So I know I'm not a fan of this type of, of thing. The other thing that you'll see is they sell like canvas gloves but they come up to your elbow. Don't buy those. Don't recommend them. A, a glove to the, to the wrist and take your jacket and cover the wrist is sufficient. If you're concerned about them getting up, you could buy Velcro straps. But what you find when you have those, and I have some of them when I first started, uh, that come up to the elbow is they, they just don't work well. You can jump right to something like this which is unorthodox. This is a pair of dishwashing gloves. It does provide protection and it also gives you dexterity. Make sure you buy some that fit. I still recommend you probably start with a cloth beekeeping glove. That's the first thing you should try. The other thing that you should have in your kit is this. This is not um, latex, it's nitrile. And a nitrile glove, people don't like these. Yeah, N-I-T-R-I-L-E, nitrile. I'll hand these around, you can look at them. Um, the benefit of these, and I don't know why that's the case, you very, very rarely get stung wearing these. The bees don't like the texture of them, and therefore they don't attack you on them, is my experience, okay? The other thing is these tend to be a little more uh, sturdy, they don't break. And if you're like me, an office worker, and you go into work and your hands are all dirty from propolis or whatever, it protects and keeps your hands clean. They do provide protection and dexterity. Can you get stung through them? Of course you can. But I think they're a good option for you to choose. Ideally, what we want you to do is to get to be gloveless. I don't want you to start gloveless. Because when you get stung on the hands, especially the fingertips, it's really painful. Until you take a couple stings and develop a little bit of uh, immunity to swelling, uh, you probably want to make sure you protect your hands. Do the nitrile gloves also work when you're working with the chemicals for the mites, like the mite strips and uh, Yeah, they're chemically rated, but I, I don't honestly want to answer that question because I'm not 100% sure. Um, you know, like I said, 
when you get stung on the fingertip, and it's almost always your index finger, when you're typing at work the next day or at home, it's really painful, and it sucks. So, gloves are a compromise, though. Eventually, you want to be able to get to be hands-free. The other thing about being, or glove-free, the other thing about that is, you tend to take your time before you reach under a frame, right? And you kill less bees. When you know you got more skin in the game, literally, not all gloves are the same, right? There's full leather, canvas, kitchen, nitrile, whatever. What you key you want, you want to take a you want it just enough protection, but you need to be able to bend your fingers and pinch. I think leather or canvas gloves are a good choice with the right material. Nitrile, good intermediate choice. Do the hand ones, not the elbow length. And I would really encourage you to have a nitrile box like I have in my kit. How many of you bought all your equipment already? Okay. Go with it. What I'm about to tell you may change your mind. Don't worry about it. Okay. These boxes are standard dimension. I do talk about, and, and if anybody came to the one meeting, the frame game, right? The one thing I would encourage you to do is get your equipment. So I, I'm just going to go through, what is it? Bottom board. Solid versus screen? Doesn't matter to me. I have a preference. I don't think screen bottom boards are that valuable. And I prefer to have a solid bottom board in the wintertime. I just think it's better for the bees. Bees are, bees are sometimes also trying to regulate the hive by airflow, and it's like having a crack in a window. They just don't get as much suck when they're trying to move the air around with an open bottom board. When you have a screen bottom board, obviously the other thing you could do is forget to put the slide in, and your bees over winter with an open hive, which is no go, <laughs> okay? So what I'm talking about is you could buy a bottom board that's solid wood on the bottom, or it has a cutout with screen mesh, and the screen mesh is supposed to be so that the varroa mite that fall, fall through, and that's one less varroa mite that's not on your bees. It was a pest management technique and also a ventilation thing. It doesn't prove to be as effective and if you want to keep your beekeeping operation simple, you can go with a solid bottom board. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. I was just, just while we're on bottom board, I was just looking at the with man lakes. Yeah. Or, or maybe it was wide on, but there's a two sides to it. One's like three eighths cut out, and one's what, seven eighths? What's the difference in what, which one would you recommend? Which way would you flip it? I guess most of them come with both cut outs on them. Yeah. This is a entrance reducer, has a standard dimension. You see the notch here. When I have it in this direction, the bees only come out that little hole. When I have it in this direction, they have a wider berth. And when I take it out, they can come out the entire distance. You want to be able to be able to put this in under the first box. That tells you which way to flip the bottom board. The bottom board should be big enough that that top box edge here this is a different kind of excluder, by the way, um, is open. That's how you know. And typically, the shallow side goes down as a fundamental answer to you. OK? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this equipment and separate it. And after we're done, please come out and look at anything. And we'll, we'll let you literally ask any question you want about it. OK? I'm going to give you terminology. This is a high body. It's also referred to as a deep because of its depth versus a medium. It's, it's a larger box. Typically, the brood nest is in here. Brood nest is where the queen lays eggs, larvae, turn to pupae, and they're capped, the actual nest. They typically live here. A standard brood box has a dimension to it. And you should be able to buy them anywhere, and they all come with the same dimension. So you don't have to worry about that. 
However, the frames are a little bit different. We'll talk about that in a second. This box, you could see it's shorter, is called the medium. There are times when people do not buy full-size boxes. They just have all mediums, boom, boom, boom. They'll have three medium boxes instead of two deeps. That's perfectly fine. A lot of people do that because these weigh less and you standardize all your equipment. There's pros and cons to that, but that's what it means about medium. Okay? You note that the number of frames you need, this holds 10 frames, this holds 10 frames, 10, 10, how many frames? 40. If I have three boxes plus two more, how many? 50. So you'll have more frames to make and all that, so keep that in mind. Um, it's called a super sometimes. It's called a super because in beekeeping terms, super means put on top. So this will be a honey super. You'll hear that term. This is what you need to get started. Two of them. Bottom board. A, this is sometimes referred to as a mouse guard or an entrance reducer. You need two boxes with frames and foundation and you need additional honey boxes to put on later when your hive expands. And then what you don't know, because you can't see it, is there's a thing called an inner cover. That's what this is. And then this is called the outer cover, or it's commonly referred to as a telescoping cover because it telescopes down over top and protects the hive. You must have an inner cover because bees glue things together and they will seal this edge. And if you didn't have this, when you put this box with a roof on it, you can't get in and break the seal. So you must have an inner cover. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, I have a top feeder here. I'll talk about that when I get to feeders. Uh, the answer is no. No, no inner cover. And I'll explain why. There's a question about the notch. Yeah, I'm going to answer that. Um, that, inner, that inner cover sometimes comes with a notch on the top. It prevents, prevents, sorry. You see, this one have it? No. Kind of. See this gap? Sometimes you'll literally see a notch cut out. It's an upper exit entrance for the bees. It's also a ventilation. All the heat from the hive raises, comes through that hole in the cover and it gets trapped underneath the roof. And if you have that gap, it's allowed to come forward and escape on a hot day. Whether you do or don't have one, a lot of people like them. You have to remember that if you're moving a hive, you gotta check to see whether it has one because if you don't seal that off, bees come out while you're transporting them. It's, it's for preference. I, th I think I have them on all of mine just because I like them. And if I don't, if I buy one of these and it doesn't have one, I literally take a Dremel tool and cut one. I prefer to have one. Notch should face the front? The notch always faces the front, thank you. And it faces up. The, the purpose, I'm sorry, no. No, no, sorry, wrong. It faces down. It should be down. Apologies, make sure you get that right. Um, the heat comes out and you don't want to create a chimney effect by putting a hole in the back of the hive because the draft will suck hot air out of the hive and there's times you want hot air. Bees need a certain amount of heat in order to create wax and if you don't have the hot air, they can't do that. So you want to make sure that any ventilation you do is out the front of the hive. It should go this way. Okay. Do they fill that in? In they will. If they they will fill in anything that they do not want open. So yes, they will fill that in. You could buy from Man Lake a kit with everything in it. If you haven't bought your stuff, or you could literally go, I want one of these, and one of these, and one of these, and one of these. My experience is, 
If you buy a kit, they usually do a really good job, but they also sell you a handful of things that you don't need. You really don't need smoker fuel, and you're spending money for that. One example. You can walk out back and get pine needles, and it's even a better fuel than what they're giving you. If, however, you don't want to muss or fuss, you can buy a kit, that's perfectly fine. You're going to end up with stuff that you'll never use, I think, but it's a matter of preference. A lot of people get started by, oh honey, I bought you a kit. <laughs> so we, we won't knock it. I want you to buy new equipment. Don't buy somebody else's equipment. You don't know what's going on with it. Could you buy somebody else's equipment? Yeah. Will you be in trouble? Probably not. But why? Buy your own. Okay? The other thing about buying your own is you know how it got manufactured. It's got all the right nails and glue and things like that. As I said, the bottom board style is your preference. Okay? Yeah? Um, I had a screen bottom board that came with my hive. Um, but could you do both? Could you start off with the uh, screen bottom board for the summertime and when you're packing it down in the winter, would it be difficult to lift everything up and put it on a, a, a closed bottom board? Um, I've done that for a number of years. And then I got tired of having to do that, so I switched to all solids. But yes, what you have to do is find that one warm day in the fall and do the switch over, take your entire stack off and put your bottom board on and, and restack it. But yes, that, that's a viable. So yeah, you can have both. You can run screen in the summer and solid in the winter. The other thing you could do, but I'm not gonna go crazy about this, is you could put one on top of the other, but that, that's, a, that's an advanced topic and I'm not gonna go there. So the answer is yes. This is gonna chap a lot of folks, I think. This is a plastic frame. This is an old one, which is gonna prove my point, I think. It's convenient. It's really easy or comes pre-assembled. It comes with a coating of wax from the factory. And some bee beekeepers really like that type of frame. There's a couple other ones in the back over there. Experience shows that if you don't manage your bees well, you don't feed them or they just don't have it in them, for whatever reason, they don't build these out very well. I've come to people's homes, taken plastic out, and I see a blurb of plastic or wax about this big and the corners are still literally plastic. For that reason alone, I don't want you to have to experience that. I would prefer that you do wax foundation. So we have wax foundation, Rick has it in his hand. I'm gonna actually show you how to put that in, okay? The thing that I say also about wax foundation is they may build it out, but at some point you're gonna pull it out of your hive and you're gonna scrape it down and you're gonna to try to redeploy it and it looks like that and you're gonna to have to re-wax it. And a lot of times what I've heard is when you re-wax it, the bees don't, for whatever reason, like it. I don't use plastic. I don't begrudge anybody that uses plastic, but if you have a start and you haven't bought your stuff yet, I would round, I would say go to Wax Foundation. So let me show you Wax Foundation. Where'd that cheat go? When you buy your frames from your manufacturer, there are different flavors of Wax Foundation. This is a crimp wire foundation. That's what these wires are. At the top of the wire that runs through, it has a little hook on the top. The hook on the top is meant to go underneath the frame rest. That's for a specific time of type of wire foundation wax frame. Now, if you go into Cali catalog and you look at version G versus version E, they're a different length, they're a different connection. So this is the guidance. When you buy your frame, buy your foundation from the same manufacturer and be sure that you buy the foundation that fits the frame that you purchased. Can you get the crimp wire? 
this is this is a crimp wire which goes with. Wait, give me one sec. <coughs> if you look at this frame, there's a, a wooden rib right here. It's got a couple nails in it. You take your knife. There's a plastic bag over there on top of the foundation with a box cutter. You take your knife and you run it along this edge and pop that little wooden cleat off. And then you set your foundation in. You can hand that around. If you look at this frame, I'll hold it up real quick. This side's solid. There's no seam. On the other side, which will become very evident, there's a seam here. The seam is so that you could take that off. If I take my knife and I run it across, I cut it free. Oh, I broke it. This is what it looks like. You could buy these too, by the way, as replacements. Now that crimp that you see on the wire, the wire goes underneath this and then you take nails and you tack it up. So when you look at the frame that's assembled, you'll get it. And I'll hand this around so you can look at it. Okay, yeah. You have a plastic frame. At some point, you take that plastic, plastic piece out and make it a wax foundation frame? The problem with that is they're not designed, they have channels that the wax or the plastic sits in, and they don't convert to uh, that type of frame. So use your plastic. And then in two years when you're going to rotate out, if you agreed with me and you want to switch to wax, then buy new frames. Or you'll have to figure out a conversion. You can, but yeah. Well, we're not putting ours together. Um, we noticed that sometimes it like ripped the foundation a little bit. Or a little, like, yeah. Is that OK, or should we do something? That's OK. Look, at that one's got a hole in the corner. They'll fill that in. Oh. OK. OK. The one thing that I will say to you is, this is a red flag. If I put this in my frame, and for some reason it has a cup to it like this, something's wrong. They should be flat. Now look, they'll always lean to the left, the right, or depending on how you've had them stored, right? But they should not be curled at the wire. That means you have the wrong foundation, okay? And you, you should do something because if you have a frame that has a curl in it like this, and you put it in your hive, they're going to build comb unequally between all the different frames, and you're going to just have problems forever. Bite the bullet and fix the problem, whatever it may be. And chances are, you didn't follow what I said earlier, is that you somehow got the wrong foundation for the frame that you have. All this frame, all this foundation has to be is a quarter inch deeper in order to get that curl and it doesn't fit right. That's why it's imperative you buy your foundation. And this is another thing. Shame on me, I didn't do it. Whenever I buy my frames like this, I literally write, all my frames say BM on them. That stands for Brushy Mountain. I know I bought my frame for Brushy Mountain. Three years from now, when I go to replace the foundation, of course, Brushy Mountain just went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> But Man Lake or, or Better Be or whatever, write the name of the company you bought it from in the year, okay? Or come up with some sort of scheme. That way, when you go to replace your foundation, you'll always know. Does that have a special name because that little piece comes out? Is it a notched frame? Is that this type of frame? Yeah, does it have a special name? Um, wedge top. A wedge top, yeah, thank you. I, I, I was trying to summon that from the depths and it wouldn't come. <laughs> It was, it was right there. Uh, so I recommend you please start with wax if it's not too late. Is this confirmed wax on all of it or just for the supers? I would do all wax, top to bottom, especially for your honey. Yeah. If you're using plastic frames, they should be changed every two years? Hey, let's, I, I didn't want to go crazy on this, but I'll answer the question. Whatever they're bringing in, accumulates in the wax. Wax is very absorbent. So if they're bringing in nasties, in time your wax is going to get loaded with nasties. 
it's a good practice to rotate your frames out every once in a while just to clean the nasties out that they may have accumulated. So the answer is yes, you should rotate your frames out every once in a while. What they say is after a period of time, maybe you take three frames out, three frames out, three frames out over a succession of three years or four the, fourth, the third year and you eventually rotate everything out. That's the way they recommend you do it. Um, I will tell you that not all frames get built the same by the bees. Sometimes they build a ton of drone comb on your frame. So what I tend to do when I do my inspections is I look at the quality of a frame for a brood chamber and if I don't like it, I move it to the outside. And in the winter time, they tend to cluster in the middle. And then in the spring, I come and I pull those frames out and they're the first ones that I get rid of. Um, I had a question somewhere. No? By rotate out, you, meant, you mean throw away? Throw away. Okay. That's what I mean. Okay. The wax, not the frame. The frame is obviously reusable. I'm sorry. Here's what you need. You need a hive tool. Regular run-of-the-mill hive tool. I am going to share this one preference. I like the easy pry, but this one's perfectly fine. Um, you need a medium height smoker. Sometimes they're smaller. Sometimes they look like a big chimney. This one is perfectly adequate. Daydont makes the best baffles. Whether it has a cage or not, doesn't matter. Your choice. Cage is supposed to protect something from connecting to the hot. I find the cage, especially this thing, to be a pain. I just happened to grab this. You obviously need fuel and you need stick lighters to light your smoker in your kit. Um, that's pretty much it. There's one other tool I'm going to mandate you buy and I'm going to show you this particular one. This is called the Varroa Easy Check. I promise you we'll be out to your hives and we're going to use this to monitor your mites. This is the brand I want you to buy. It's called the Varroa Easy Check. Okay? I'll hand it out and you can look at it. Um, this thing is optional but extremely useful. It's called a frame rest. Okay? Let me show you how it works goes here alongside. When you pull out a frame, instead of putting the frame down on the ground or laying it against whatever when you kick it over and all that other stuff, you set it right here. You can tell how much mine's used. It's all rusty and whatever, but it's a frame rest. That's what it's called. You probably want to have one of these, a bee brush. There's a bunch of different ways to do that. You could use a turkey feather and other things. One, one thing I'll share just so I can repeat this and, and ingrain it on you forever because you'll always hear me say this. Flick your bees. Flick when you use one of these. Don't sweep. When you sweep it's like grabbing them by the back and grinding them across the comb. When you flick it's like get off, get off, get off. Okay? So a bee brush. Don't brush in the literal sense. Flick. This thing is called a frame grip. I don't recommend this thing. It's so enticing, everybody wants to buy one. I'm telling you, don't do it. Here's the way it works. You go down and you grab your frame and you pull it up and then what do you do with it? especially when you have a long one and it's heavy and you're trying to figure, you, you can't handle it. I don't think they've ever come up with a good design for this. So don't buy one. I get asked all the time whether I should buy one of those. So that's the reason why I, literally with your fingers, yeah. We'll show you when you come how to do it. Obviously you need a yard cart, tool caddy. I have my little husky thing. I have another one too that I use. I didn't bring a queen excluder. At some point you're going to want one of those, depending on what you do. Um, any questions about this? 
I think I got everything. I'll get there. Everybody's kit is special to them. I know somebody who loves blue tape and has it everywhere he goes. <laughs> Mr. Master Beekeeper over there. Screwdrivers, paint scrapers, queen painting kits, whatever it may be. I do not begrudge you the fun at Christmas time to go pick fun things out of the catalog. Have a blast, right? Uh, we'll send you a list of all the things you might want to have or you could take a look in mine. Yeah. Um, one thing that I recommend in your B kit, and this was recommended by my physician when I was having my physical. Ah. We got in a conversation about, you know, I'm the beekeeper and, you know, I break the honey. And her first question was, do you have an EpiPen? So that might be something you want to um, discuss with your physician. Where do you get it from? They have to prescribe it. The prescription. It's prescription only. They're going to prescribe it to you. Yeah. My EpiPen, it ended up costing me, I guess, $35 for cheap now. Through my insurance. Yeah, they're not as expensive. I'm going to talk about feeders. I don't know where the name came from. This is called a division board feeder, inner feeder. You put it inside the hive. It lays just like a frame. You have to pull a frame out to put this in. It has a hole, and in the hole is a plastic ladder style system that the bees can cling with their feet and walk down. When you fill it with liquid, the bees walk down to the liquid level, take a drink, and they come back out. Sorry, they drown bees. It's just inevitable. Bees go in there and they get fall off and drown and whatever. Um, so when you have these, you have to look every once in a while and clean them out. You use this type of feeder in the beginning, so you're going to need some, to feed your bees. When it's cold outside, you can take advantage of the heat the bees make in order to keep this liquid warm enough for them to take it because they won't drink cold sugar solution. And you'll hear us say when we get to next session about feeding the bees and how to mix feed and all that other stuff. There's two examples of feeders here that you put inside the hive. You can come look at these in a bit. I was asked about a top feeder. This is a top feeder. There's two different kinds here. Um, inner feeder, top cover feeder. Okay. This one is made by Man Lake, right? Man Lake. This is the feeder you want. I don't care where you buy your feeders and your equipment, but buy Man Lake when it comes to this. The goal of this thing is when it's hot out and you want to feed a lot of liquid, this is it. You literally can pour a gallon on either side. The bees come up through this middle hole and then they walk down the screen to the liquid and they'll suck down gallons of liquid in a day if you feed them this way. So you're going to need to buy one of these for every hive and you should probably consider at least one of these for a hive or a handful yeah. of these. Yep, you need them both. You wouldn't have both of them at the same time? No. No, you use this one for a lot of feed during warm weather. You use this one for reasonable amount of feed in colder weather or, you know, if you're, if you're not, if you don't need to feed a lot. There's a term called dearth. When you get to June, July, Sometimes in August, it dries up in New Jersey, the creeks dry out, creek beds and whatever. And you may need to feed your bees or give them water. You always give them water. You, you would use this to feed them in that case, or that, depending on what they needed. Okay? There are jar feeders. It's an upside down mayonnaise jar with a contraption that fits on the bottom that you slide into the entrance of the hive. Don't buy them. You'll see them in the catalog referred to as a Boardman feeder. You could use them to give water to the bees, but if you're giving sugar water to the bees at the front entrance, you're enticing the rest of the neighborhood to come and rob your hive. And they just generally don't work very well. They're small in volume and those just don't, I don't need to explain it any further. Don't do it. Yeah. Did you mention that when you're using the inner feeder that it's replaced I did. Yeah, did everybody hear a question? Two frames or one frame? Oops. It's usually one frame. However, when you pull one frame and you put one of these in, man, things are like really tight in there. 
So sometimes people just pull two. And then you're running basically an eight frame. You're, usually it goes in right next to where the bee's nest is. So, so the base. yeah, okay. in the bottom box typically. Especially, well, when you start, you're going to start with one box, so it's going to be in there. In the future, you're going to need some more stuff. Inevitable, right? You, you want to harvest honey, you need equipment for that, right? So you'll need extraction equipment, uncapping tools, bottles for honey, things like that. We're going to have the mite conversation and the moth conversation and some of the pests that you have to deal with, so you need that equipment. I'll be with you in a sec. So you need treatment products, you'll need traps, you'll need wax moth repellent storage and things like that. Give me one sec, Ida. I would recommend at some point that you're probably going to want other equipment. You might need more honey supers. You might want nuke boxes for management practices. You're going to need an escape board, which I'll explain to you what that is later, but that clears the bees out so you can take the harvest for the honey, okay? Or you could use a fume board or other things and other stuff. So go ahead, Ida. Um, new beekeepers should not expect to get honey their first year, okay? Just don't expect to be taking honey this year. They need to build up their, their, the wax and get ready for the winter, and there's not going to be honey for you. It's all going to be for them. You have to assume that you're not going to get honey in the first year, and if they happen to make you honey, which does happen every once in a blue moon, you can, um, you know, count yourself blessed. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Should you use an excluder between the brew boxes and the honey boxes? I didn't bring an excluder today, but the answer is no. You don't need to use an excluder. 90% of the time in the upper box. Now, look, this is the way this works. Put bees in this box. They grow to occupy all 10 frames. Then you put the second box on, and they grow to occupy these other 10 frames. Now the brood box is adequate size to contain a colony, and they generally don't grow bigger than that. And when they have enough space, they put honey across the top of the frames up here and the queen doesn't pass that honey. So your queen very rarely will go up into these boxes and lay. And the backstory to your question is, what if the queen's up here laying eggs in where you're gonna harvest honey? You don't want that to happen. So sometimes people put a queen excluder in. There's a common term that a queen excluder is a honey excluder <laughs> because the bees have to pass through it and sometimes it becomes a barrier. But the answer is no. Now you will need a queen excluder to exclude the queen for other management techniques, which we'll get to in year two. Yeah. Just a, I was a little confused when in, in the inner feeder and the top feeder on April thirteenth when you're installing your your packages. Yep. Is that just an inner feeder at that point? Inner feeder. Yeah. So let me clear that up for you. You're going to want to feed your bees when you get them. And in April through to probably uh, mid-May, the weather in New Jersey is fluctuating. You could have cold nights down to 20 degrees or whatever. If you put liquid on the top of the hive, the bees don't keep that warm. It gets chilled overnight. And then unless you have a super strong sun warm day, 80 degrees, which could happen, that liquid's going to stay cold and they're not going to drink it which negates the reason that you fed them. When it's in with the bees, they generate enough heat to keep the colony functional, and the residual heat from the colony warms the liquid in the feeder, which is right next to them. So until the middle of May, you're doing internal feeding. Once it gets to be 60, 70 degrees at night, and it's warm during the day, you know, you get almost summer-like weather, then you can feed on top if you want. So, yeah. Does that division board feeder go on the outside, or does it matter where you put it? It goes on the outside. Yeah. yeah, and again, we're gonna get to, in the next round, how to feed, how to make the liquid, where to put it, 
how to open the hive and get to the feeder without opening the entire hive. We will get to that. Feeding is a really important instruction that you're going to get more detail on. I just want to look, remember, from getting started to bees in the box, I need you to buy this equipment so when we tell you how to use it, you have it. That's what we're doing today.